I'm so happy to be here. So let me just say while I'm waiting, if you can hear me, yesterday uh, night I was in New York City and now I am in my house in Los Angeles. And Linus is lying here. Maybe I can show you Linus. See him? Yeah. He's, uh, he's resting because uh, chats tire him out. Uh, live chats just, uh, he just gets knackered. Am I, can I say that? Can I say knackered? Is that good? Okay. Um, so I have, uh, I have um, printed out questions from you, and I will also see uh, tweets uh, from you, so uh, that's great. Um, and I'm going to just start. Okay, Susan Webb. Susan Webb is the deputy head at uh, Brandon School, and she's a, uh, a specialist, a dyslexic um, specialist. And she says that Henry's books have been a real inspiration to her students. What a great first question. Uh, and offer an open invitation to Henry to visit. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, if, I, if I can, you know, I tour uh, England with um, uh, the First News, the only newspaper for children. And uh, we tour, and my, one of my favorite things in my whole life is that I go into schools and visit with students. And I'll tell you what I tell them, uh, that I am a, uh, a husband, a father, uh, we have three kids, two dogs, you just saw them, Linus and uh, Charlotte. Uh, I am a director, a producer, a, a writer of children's books with my partner, Lynn Oliver. Can I hold this up? We've written uh, 23 novels, Ghost Buddy and also The Zippity Zinger, uh, well, it, uh, Hank Zipser. Hank Zipser. And I'm in the bottom 3% in the country, in America, um, academically. I was bad in English, in math, in science, in uh, uh, spelling. Uh, reading was hard. It still is very difficult for me. And um, I was great at lunch, actually. Yeah. So, let's see. No, I don't see uh, a live chat tweet yet, so I'm going to... Uh, oh, so what was the, the inspiration behind the books? Sorry, Susan. The inspiration was my life. Um, the inspiration was my life as a dyslexic uh, all through school. I found out uh, that I was dyslexic when I was 31. When our, uh, my son, my oldest son, my stepson, Jed, uh, he was diagnosed. And everything they said about him, it seemed to be true about me. And at 31, I learned that I wasn't stupid, I wasn't lazy, that I had a, a learning challenge. Okay. I'm going to the next question. Natalie Powers. Should teachers try to get children labeled so they can cure them, or should they concern themselves with finding teaching styles to facilitate children with dyslexia. Well, okay. So, Natalie, let me just say this. You can't cure dyslexia. It's the wiring in the brain. A child is born with wiring. We come as we are. It is hereditary. It's passed down from generation to generation. So, there is no curing. What there is is negotiating. You learn to negotiate your learning, uh, your learning challenges. And teachers, and I've met so many across the entire United Kingdom, uh, there are wonderful teachers who understand the child who learns differently now. And yes, you should encourage that student, because believe me, a child who has a learning challenge knows all too well they are not doing well. They don't need to be reminded, scolded, uh, punished. They are punishing themselves. Trust me. Okay. Dave Andrews. Dave Andrews. Hi, Dave. 
As a young maths and science teacher, I'm very concerned with the current level of literacy and indeed um, uh, the, uh, the this is a, a word here I can't even read, um, but I'm sure it has to do with math. Uh, what teaching strategies or cultural changes do you think um, have caused or can change these levels going forward? That's a good question. I mean, not being an expert, you know. Uh, but I, my instinct is math is hard for me. I, I literally cannot compute when I see it. If, some, if I go into a store and I buy, let's say, a slice of pizza, and I give paper money. I get change back in my palm. I have no idea, first of all, how much change I'm supposed to have. And second of all, I can't add it up in my head that fast. So I always trust that the person is being honest with me. A cultural change. I think that somehow the notion of being able to do well in school has all of a sudden gone from being a terrific thing to a, um, you know, you can make fun of those kids. I think that we have to change the, 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 the image of education, you know. I think that just that simple thing, changing the image. Uh, what else do I think? Oh, we celebrate the top 10% of every class. There is the bottom 10%, which I was in. These are the kids who are allergic to school. There's a poor connection. It says I'm getting a poor connection. Oh, my gosh. Are we still going? Is this good? Can you see me? Can someone tweet, yes, I see you. Yes, I hear you. Can you tweet me? Okay. Should I keep going? Um, yeah. Okay. So, the, the bottom 10%, that's what, that's what I was talking about. All right. Um, you know, the top 10% are going to be our doctors, our mathematicians, our scientists, our engineers. But the bottom 10%, are, we're allergic to school. Our brain doesn't work that way. And we are very good, however, with other parts of our being, with our bodies, with our bodies as a dancer, uh, with our hands as a sculptor, with our hands as a plumber, as a builder, as a, uh, a plasterer. Why don't we celebrate them also? You know, I'll tell you what is really interesting is that I am uh, very aware that I'm getting no feedback, you know, so it's really weird. Usually when I speak, I hear the crowd, see the crowd, feel them, uh, hear them. This is, okay, I just wanted to say that. It's sort of strange. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, that I learned that I wasn't stupid. Yes, okay. Moving on. Amanda, Amanda Crowther, I hope I pronounced you. I think my nine-year-old daughter might be dyslexic. Can you suggest the best approach to take? Okay, first of all, have your daughter tested. There has to be, in your town, in your township, there has to be uh, some place where a child can be tested. Um, uh, there might be a dyslexic uh, foundation right there uh, in your vicinity. Second of all, I really think this is so important. Make sure that your child is buoyed. Make sure your child's self-image does not um, plummet. Because it is so easy for a child who is dyslexic to feel so badly about themselves that their self-image shuts down uh, they then cannot accomplish anything. Uh, they then start acting out. So do not be embarrassed by your child. Know that uh, it's hereditary. Uh, be supportive of your child. And there will be a teacher somewhere in your vicinity who can help and understand that child who learns differently. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, here's a, a child who has le learning challenges doesn't need to be reminded. Oh, so you're just repeating what I'm saying. Okay, moving on. 
I'm, um, uh, Viv coming. Viv, hi Viv. Do you think there is a significant correlation between the impact of dyslexia on a child and the subsequent possibility of mental health issues, anxiety? Do you know what? I'm sure. The, the, the idea that a child wakes up in the morning and they want to do well, they want to succeed, then they go to school and it is difficult for them. It just is the way they were born. So then all of a sudden they're thinking, I want to do well. I thought I prepared. I really tried. Why is it still difficult? That can lead to a child then um, probably uh, experiencing other things. I can't talk about those things because I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm just a guy, uh, a dad of three dyslexic children. Uh, once I realized that I was, um, through Jed, the two youngest then uh, benefited from that. And we just took steps to make sure that they felt great. Oh, that's my, the phone in my office for me. But Sarah's going to answer it. Okay. The other thing is that I was thinking, you're supposed to have a great light, a good chair, a good desk, quiet for the students, right? It, you, you have to set up the, the study place. So let's take Max, for instance. Max now is 29. He is a director and a writer of scripts. He would never sit in his chair. He put one knee on his chair. He stood at his desk. He listened to the radio. For the longest time, I said to, Je uh, to, to Max, I said, you can't listen to the radio when you're doing your homework. Turn that off immediately. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I realized, maybe the radio was creating a place for him that was blocking all the sound so that he could funnel his concentration into his studies. Now, standing, maybe lying on his bed, standing at his desk, listening to the radio, he did everything that you're not supposed to do except the grades were coming home. So I learned a very important lesson. I learned to shut up. Max had found her, his own strategy, went on to university, and is now just a fabulous man, a fabulous guy, a fabulous director. Okay, turning the page. Um, Andy Longstaff. <clears throat> Having seen a bit of life now, should Henry have the opportunity of addressing secondary school, uh, what advice would he give about his approach to their education? School looks different to every child. It is true that we use a very standard method of teaching. But not every child really gets it. It's like you're writing on the board. Uh, the teacher is writing on the board, writing a simple sentence. I'm sitting there as a student. I'm looking at that board. I'm reading Greek. You know, I used to go home with uh, highlighters, yellow highlighters, and I would highlight the important parts of the book. It turned out there was not one thing that was too small for me to highlight. I had highlighted the entire book, and when I was done, I still didn't understand what I was reading. I, I now... So scripts are really hard, right? And that's my whole life, is, is reading and, and memorizing scripts. So what I do is... I read them very carefully. I read them um, slowly. Where there's a will, there is a way. Would, could somebody just um, type up on the, uh, on the tweet here, how am I doing? Am I being clear? Am, uh, am I being useful? I would love to just have some feedback um, so that I, I know that I'm not boring everybody into their socks. No? Okay. Okay. Moving on until that happens. 
Um, so how is everybody? Huh? It's Tuesday, fall is coming. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is Susie Woodgate. Suzanne. Sorry. Suzanne Woodgate. In the UK, plans are currently being unveiled for a new system of examination which relies entirely on performance in exams at the end of the school year with no modules or retakes. Okay, all I can say is we have a big test here in America called the SATs. A student in the junior year and in the, in the third year of high school takes this exam, prepares for it, and then can take it again uh, to see how they, how they did in order to send it to a, a university. If I only had to take that exam once, and I could not take it a second time and prepare, I don't know where I would be. I certainly I don't think I would be here talking to you at this moment. I don't... That does not take into account such a large number of students who are not good at tests, no matter how smart they are, how verbal they are. My kids were unbelievably verbal. I thought it was really important for my kids to have chores. They were so good at negotiating. I did their chores. They were unbelievably smart. Great debaters. If I did not take a test the second time, or untimed. I don't know what my future would have been. Honest, I, I don't, I, that's, that's as, as clear as I can be. I, you are, that, that is so not understanding one-fifth of the population of students. Then add to that the kids who are incredibly smart, who just aren't good. They freeze. They freeze up on tests. I, I don't know what else to say. I don't, think, I don't think that is a great way to service education or a vast majority of children. Okay. Um, oh, for teachers who, um, for kids who uh, are a little bit of a troublemaker, let me say, yes, there are some psychopathic people. There are some kids who are just troubled. That is absolutely the truth. But for the most part, as I said before, a kid wakes up, wants to do well, can't do well, I used humor. I made the class laugh in order to cover up my embarrassment. As a matter of fact, I have defined dyslexia this way. You spend a third of your time trying to figure out school. You spend a third of your time trying to figure out why you cannot figure out school. And you spend a third of your time covering up your shame and humiliation for not doing well. And I covered it up with humor. So the kid who is acting out is probably covering for the embarrassment of not understanding, of not being able to spell. I mean, I literally... Do you know that I use... I say this to the kids. I, I use spell check... Uh, on the computer, and Spellcheck yells at me, Are you nuts? I don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay. Children want to do well. We talked about that. Okay, here is um, Stephen Duckworth. My question for Mr. Winkler is, Are you doing school visits anymore? Yes, I am, Stephen. I love them. But all of these school visits that I do in the United Kingdom are done through First News uh, newspaper for children. 
I travel with them across um, the uh, United Kingdom. We've gone all the way from the north of Ireland to the very tip of uh, England. And I have tried to fly fish all the way. So far, I've only caught two beautiful trout. Uh, on my last trip, as a matter of fact, uh, I, um, I caught a trout. Beautiful. Nice 18 inch. Okay. All right. Back in. So, yes, I do do school visits. It's one of my most exciting experiences because when you sit in that room and there are five or six hundred kids, beautiful children, sitting in their uniforms on that hard gymnasium floor, and they are all attentive, and we laugh together and we talk together and. Then I'm told that, or I get a letter, that a child who's never read before has chosen one of my books to read and has read five, then in a row. That's probably the greatest compliment uh, I've ever received in my whole life. Ever, ever, ever. Except that um, I think one of my children uh, actually said, You're okay. That was good. I, I, so I've held that on in my heart for years now. 30. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Moving on. Uh, I teach a unit of children with mild uh, compound or complex behavioral needs. They would be inspired and thrilled by a visitor. Oh, thanks. Well, um, get in touch with uh, First News um, because my next tour, I'm hoping, 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 uh, will be in June. I'm doing a Broadway play uh, that opens in November. And uh, I'm hoping right after that, uh, right after the, the, the play, I leave the play, to come to uh, England again. You know, I, I heard from the Queen. She gave me an award. So a kid who was told that I would never be anything that I was stupid. My, my parents, uh, some of you know this, I, I've, I've uh, said this before, my parents had an affectionate phrase for me growing up. They called me Dumme Hund. For those of you who don't speak German, that means dumb dog. Lovely people. Lovely. Great. So, dumb dog, years later, got a, uh, the order of the British Empire from the Queen of England. You know, when I was in uh, drama school uh, at uh, Yale, I was in the, uh, the drama school there, and one of the actors said, uh, you know, you're not good enough. You're not, you're not, you're, you're, not um, you're not great at what you do. You're stupid. Yes, and I um, uh, felt bad. And then I came to Hollywood. And I met that young man who told me I would never make it. He sold me a lamp at a, an Ikea. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Where's the last lesson? Okay, moving right along. Um, let's see who else. Do we have here? Do we have... Um, okay, no. We don't have any questions yet. Oh! Mindy, Mindy Keller Keery. What was one way your high school teachers helped or hindered you? Okay. Mindy Keller Keery. My high school teacher actually said, um, I don't expect you to graduate, so if you ever do get out of here, you're going to be okay. That's probably not the way to inspire a child. What is the way that a teacher who acknowledges a student, a teacher who sees the kid in front of them and says, I know you have a problem and we're going to either work on that problem or Maybe I'm going to give you work in a different way, a way that you are able to achieve. 
maybe that is a great way. Maybe that would have been an unbelievable way for uh, the teachers. I went to a private school for boys. I wore a blue blazer, gray slacks, a tie every day. Dr. Chamberlain was the headmaster of my, teach of my school. He said, Winkler, I want to know why you're not achieving. I said, hey, that makes two of us. I'd like to know that too. And uh, I think that it all comes down to everything that I see, everything that I hear. Oh, that's interesting. I hear and learn through my ears. Now, I don't, I, mean, I don't mean that I just hear through my ears. I learn about the world, about a subject, through my ears. I'm, I'm a really careful listener for that very reason. It doesn't go through my eyes. It goes through my ear. That might be a very interesting way to look at uh, your class um, tomorrow. How am I doing? Um, okay. Okay. I have no idea. I'm just going to continue. Okay. You can. All right. Uh, does somebody want to um, uh, tweet me? Uh, <clears throat> should I should I keep going? Is this interesting? Could somebody tell me? Yes, yes. Keep going. Yes, you're interesting. See, look at this. No one ever said that uh, being a uh, a star, having played the Fonz, means that you're, you know, confident in real life. If you had my children, you would not be confident. Um. Okay. Anybody? No. All right. So, what else? What else would you ask me? I, I keep coming back to the same idea. Children who learn differently cannot help themselves. They cannot. The my um, my printer is going wild here next to me. Maybe it's going. It will give you a speech later. No. Um, it's, I'm in a busy place. One day, not one phone call is for me. Nobody ever calls me. It's shocking. Okay. Um, okay, you can't yell through the screen, can you? No. So I can't know your questions. Okay, so the dyslexic student, one try to maintain their self-image because their self-image on the inside is as thin as rice paper. Maybe there is somebody in the community, in the community of your classroom, a retired somebody who could come in and sit in the back of the classroom and maybe work with one or two students at a time. They're sitting at home. I think that they would feel unbelievably useful. Uh, maybe some of you do that. I saw that in some of the schools. Oh, there was a great thing I saw in one of the schools right in London. The head um, uh, mistress, her name was um, Mary. This, this was amazing. There was a, a young man who lived right next door to the school. But I mean like right next door in this uh, apartment complex. And the little boy was late every day. And Mary, the, uh, the headmistress, the headmaster, the head teacher, she introduced this little boy to the groundskeeper. And every morning, this little boy went on the rounds with the groundskeeper and he became the gardener. The little boy helped with the weeding. And he felt so useful. So great. He loved working with his hands in the dirt of the earth. He never showed up late again. And he went from weeding to reading. He felt so good about himself that he was now helpful in some way. He started to excel. <clears throat> Excuse me. You never know 
where the inspiration is going to come from. It really is the, the student feeling good about themselves. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for my, and, and I know it is your tradition, but for me, I don't have a stiff upper lip. I think, we're, I think we've lost you. So what does that say? You're still being seen here, so... You think we just keep going? Yeah. Okay. Um, something came up on my screen, and uh, being uh, non-technical, uh, in it, uh, I, it said that I, something is not found, so I thought I was lost. Okay. Well, so, all right, let me say this then as we wrap up. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you, the teachers, who are incredibly connected to your students. I wish I had you. I know that the, the students that do have you appreciate you. You know, after the parent, the teacher, is probably the most important influence on a child. And in my country, anyway, we have no, very little respect for teachers. In some countries, they're called doctori. In our country, we constantly try to cut their pay. I am indebted to you on behalf of my children. As a citizen of the world, on behalf of the children I meet, I am indebted to you, you teachers who understand the child who learns differently. I'm not kidding. I hope you all have the most wonderful fall. I hope you have a great holiday season, even though we're a few months away. But pretty soon, adverts are going to show up on TV when, with Christmas carols. So let me be the very first on the earth to wish you a great holiday. And I, I, I hope I made sense to you. I hope I didn't bore you like into cream cheese. Or as you say, soft cheese. <laughs>